sovereign God, in whom we find refuge and strength, direct our steps today. Let us remember with humility that our charge is to follow where you lead. We can't race ahead of where you are moving. Calm our spirits and lift the delusions of control from our beings, for we seek that which only you can give. Carry us, Lord, toward the building up of your kingdom. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I am not afraid. Gracious Lord, we give you glory and thanks for this day. Continue to pour out your bountiful blessings and mercy on us and help us to walk in your light. Strengthen us in the areas where we are weak, that we may be obedient to you at all times. Guide and teach us and always say and do that we may live according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
church, God's kingdom. If you will follow Christ Jesus, this time we all got tired of closed-minded folks. But thought about that. The foolish versions in the Matthew text, that's, that's what was going on with them. They were closed-minded, too closed-minded to prepare for what was coming, too closed-minded to save their resources for when they really needed them. They, they were too closed-minded. And that's why they fell asleep. I thought about that thing. When Joshua was facing the nation, and asked the nation, who will you choose? And they said, we want to choose the Lord. And Joshua said, you can't choose the Lord. He was telling them that their history, their, their understanding had been too cold run. There was no way they could follow the Lord, living and serving the way they had been in the past. I know COVID didn't mess up your anniversary. I know it has shocked the system of the church. But I want you to know something this year in your anniversary. There has always been a faith-based bond throughout the black community. Since the beginning of time, that the only way our ancestors got through day to day was to pray and send hymns that would bring them home. Home meaning away from where they were to freedom. It seems to me that no matter how hard people of color endure trials and battles and some sense of, 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 of faith, the only thing that got them through tough situations has been the church. The importance of community among black people it's something that has always been the catalyst and, and of itself. Being that we were born to look out for our own people. Because, let's face it, who else will? Spiritually, and the role of the black church in the African American community has always been quite important. Whether it involves assisting families with resources, are being treated as a place to lay our troubles down and give their burdens to God and hope that their prayers would be answered. Looking back at the old movies such as Color Purple, there were always scenes where black folk were at church in the South during the hot summer month praising God, God for everything that he has done for them despite their pain and feelings. Even when it comes to grieving a loved one who was innocently killed by life in the streets or the fact that our system didn't care enough about colored youth Somehow black folk always find a way to see good after dealing with heartache. For the most part, a lot of black people in the community will probably agree. There's always been a mother, an aunt, a grandmother, a granny, a mom dear that has held our families together with the power of prayer and the power of seeking God. A mother, an aunt, an ancestor, somebody along the lines that when everybody else in the family and the community were giving up, they held on to the light. They held on to the power. They held on to the love. They kept the faith. They stayed away. So I'm telling you, Wesley, you and the black church have always been central to redeeming the soul of America. And I challenge you. I think it goes without saying 
that this year has been a rough and a difficult year. As a matter of fact, to say that 2020 has been difficult is probably the understatement of the year. This has been a year when we've had to learn to make constant adjustments in the midst of uncertainty. A year when questions exponentially outweigh answers. A year when we've had to navigate in waters that we've never sailed through before. We've seen businesses close and bankruptcy shut down industries that will never be reopened again. We've struggled with online education and ways to make certain that our children still form and develop while sitting in front of computer screens at home. We've had to deal with an inescapable presence in the very valley of the shadow of death. COVID-19 has claimed more than 230,000 lives in this nation alone. From January till now, we've been bombarded with the constant killing of unarmed black and brown bodies at the hands of those called to serve and protect. We've sat by and we've watched legends and icons and figures of our faith and our movement pass on to go home to be with the Lord on high. This has been a difficult year. And even now in November, we come to the end of this year, Bishop, almost asking the same question that Gideon asked God when the Lord calls Gideon in Judges chapter 6 and says, God has an assignment on your life. Gideon looks back at the angel and says, if God is with us, why is all this happening to us? And beloved, none of us are immune from that question. Life can put you in such a bind, dealing with so many uncertainties, struggles, and suffering, that you begin to wonder if God is with us, why is all this happening? In the midst of these uncertain days, in the midst of the struggles of our season, in the midst of the valley of the death that we find ourselves navigating through, I come today on this night to share with you a word from the Lord that prayerfully will encourage us to know that God is yet on the throne. I would encourage you to turn to your Bibles with me, but, but I'm afraid you don't need your Bible for this verse. If you've been raised in church, if you've been around the body of Christ for any amount of time, my gut feeling is you already know this verse. You don't even have to open your Bible. This verse is right up there with the Lord is my shepherd. This verse is right up there with weeping only endures for a night. This verse can be compared with no weapon formed against you shall prosper. This is the verse that holds its head with they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. In the book of Romans, in chapter 8, and verse 28, you hear these words of Paul that, that echo in our hearing tonight. In Romans 8 and verse 28, Paul declares this, For we know that all things work together for good, for them that love God are the called according to his purpose. For we know that all things work together for good, for them that love God, and are the called according to his purpose. One more time for good measure, for we know that all things work together for good for them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. Do me a favor if you would, you're taking notes, if you're chatting, if you got someone nearby, just tell them these words, it's all good. It's all good. Beloved, Romans 8.28, one of those verses that holds you together when it seems like life is trying to pull you apart. Romans 8.28 is what you remind yourself of when bad news catches you off guard. Romans 8.28, that's what you speak over your life when you find out that your friends are fake and your enemies are real. Romans 8.28 is what you tell yourself when you wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror and you know it's about to be a rough day. 
Romans 8.28 is what you quote when it seems like everything in your life is going from bad to worse. Romans 8.28, that's what you meditate on when you're anxious about the unknown and the uncertain and you don't know when and how and where things are going to work out. Romans 8.28. That's what you quote when you're watching election results come in and at the beginning of the news cycle, it seems like things are not going to go favorably in your way, but yet you hold on and you remind yourself of this. We know that all things work together for good for them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Beloved, there are a few passages in Scripture that give you as much assurance and hope and faith in God as these words Paul writes to this young church in Rome as they are preparing to face a season of persecution under the emperorship of Nero. And Paul sends them these words to let them know, we know that all things work together for good for them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. If you would hang out in this one verse with me tonight and let's explore some of the bounty of its beauty. Paul says, beloved, we know. Now, before you rush on too fast and before you skip over that, Bishop, that seems to suggest that this verse is not universally applicable to all people in all places. It seems like this verse is written to a group called we. We know. And one of the very first questions we must ask as we begin to dig into the beauty and bounty of this scripture, who is we? Who are the we that Paul is addressing? Who is it that knows all things work together for good? Who are the we that Paul is addressing? Well, it seems to me that the question of the we in the beginning of the verse is really answered at the end of the verse because at the end of the verse, Paul says it works together for a particular group of people. For them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Who's the we? The ones that love God and are called according to his purpose. If you begin in that very first passage, we are able to do supernatural things in our lives. So yes, people will be saved. Yes, people will be healed. Yes, people will be delivered. Yes, your prayers can change your house. Yes, your prayers can change your circumstances. Yes, your prayers can even change this world because it's not simply you. It's you partnering your natural with God's super and supernatural things will happen in your life because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's why people look at you differently when you walk into places. It's not because you're so great. I know you think you look good and you're all that in a bag of chips, but it's really because of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in us gives us a glow, gives us a joy that the world can't take away, gives us a peace that surpasses all understanding. Number one, I see the promise of God being fulfilled. Number two, I see the presence of the Holy Spirit. But number three in this text, I see the power of God. God empowers us through the Holy Spirit. And I need you to understand on this day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit empowers us to be able to do a lot of things that we would not or couldn't do on our own. That's why you may have a task that someone gives you and, and it seemed impossible or you got really nervous about it. But when you prayed and God moved, then you felt so much better and it just kind of flows from you. That's because of the Holy Spirit empowering you. You can read that scripture. You can pray out loud. You can give sermons. You can witness to somebody else because the Holy Spirit empowers you. Yeah, you couldn't do it if it was just about you. But because the Holy Spirit gives you power, you're able to do it. I could not preach to you right now if the Holy Spirit wasn't right here with me, giving me the power, giving me the word to be able to give back to you. My brothers and my sisters, that's why we sing that song. Lead me, guide me along the way. For if you lead me, I cannot stray. Lord, let me walk each day with thee. Lead me, O oh Lord, lead me. Because the Holy Spirit leads us and the Holy Spirit empowers us. 
And that's why I must say to you today, you've got to be very careful in this walk that you listen to the Holy Spirit. You cannot make up your mind and ask God to bless it. Now, I I know this is probably foreign to you, but there are people in other parts of the country, other parts of the world that actually choose what they want. And then they ask God to bless it. Like they'll say, oh, I want this house. God bless me. So I have this house. I want this car. God bless me. So I have this car. I want this man or woman. God bless me. So I'll have them And, and tell God what you want. And then ask God to bless your decisions. But that is not the way it's supposed to go. The Bible teaches us that what we're supposed to do is to seek first the kingdom of God, which means we ask God first what is supposed to happen. And God leads us in the path that God wants us to go in our lives. And so some of us have wasted days, months, weeks, even years of our lives because we were trying to do our own thing and not waiting for the Holy Spirit to lead God and direct us. Not waiting for the Holy Spirit to say, yes, do that. Go buy that or go there or talk to that person. And when we don't do that, we are outside of the will of God. It's important that we listen to the Holy Spirit and that we don't grieve the Holy Spirit. How do you grieve the Holy Spirit? When when you allow all manner of evil to be around, when you know the Holy Spirit is there. That's why there are some things that you can't do when you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. Things that you may have been able to do before you were saved, before you were Holy Ghost filled, but you're not able to do now because the Holy Spirit is dwelling inside of you. So don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Saints of old used to say, don't grieve the Holy Spirit because they were talking about when you got the unction, whenever there was something in you that wanted to make you shout, wanted to make you cry, wanted to make you dance, wanted to make you shout out in church and and, and you held it in and you contained it within yourself. So those saints would say, don't grieve the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit should have free access and free reign in your life. And I will tell you that is absolutely positively true. Don't try to restrain your praise of God. Don't try to hold it in or hold it down. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit in that. But I've got to tell you even further than that as a pastor today. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit by making up your own mind, trying to make God do your will instead of you doing God's will. Look what happens in this text. The power of the God of Godhead came upon them. The Holy Spirit is there with them. And what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit brought unity to Jews and Gentiles alike. To people from all different nationalities, all different races, all different creeds, the Holy Spirit brought unity. And think about where we are right now, my brothers and my sisters, what's happening in our nation, in our world. More than anything, we need to have unity. So we need to be making sure that we are praying in the Spirit and that we are asking the Holy Spirit to make us unified with others and that God is glorified through our lives. And so as a result of the Holy Spirit bringing Bringing this unity, Jews and Gentiles came together on one accord. They were in the same place and they were doing the same thing and they were on the same accord. The Spirit of the Lord had his way in their lives. And that's what God wants to do in and through us as believers, my brothers and my sisters. God wants to allow God's power to shine in and through your life so that when other people look at you, they're not simply seeing you, but they see God inside of you, that they know that there's something different about you than others that they've come in contact with, that they know that there's a light on you, that there is is a, a faith in you, that they know that there's a peace in you, that they know without a shadow of a doubt that God's Spirit reigns in you. And they may not be able to articulate it the same way that we can, but the Holy Spirit will bring unity into your life to your to the point where instead of drawing confusion, instead of drawing arguments, instead of helping to create chaos, your life will bring peace. So when you come in the room, arguments begin to stop. When you begin to speak, you're able to help people to draw their hearts and spirits back together. You're able to calm things down and to bring a blessed assurance. We don't have to agree to be in you. Or what he had done. Verse nine, he said to his people, look, The people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. Verse 10, we must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. If we don't, and if we war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us. Then they will escape from the country. And then if we move down to Exodus 14, 
beginning at the 29th verse. But the people of Israel had walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground as the water stood up like walls on both sides. Verse 30, that is how the Lord rescued Israel from the land of the from the hand of the Egyptians that day. And the Israelites saw the bodies of the Egyptians wash up on the seashore. Verse 31, when the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians, they were filled with awe before God. They put their faith in the Lord and in God's servant, Moses. Family, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Family, the goal was to make it to freedom. An unknown in those early days, but it was by the way of the Red Sea. The goal was to make it to freedom, even though they had no idea who or what was going on, but it was by way of a servant that had a tumultuous birth narrative, had a criminal history, had full of anxieties and fears. You see Belfont and friends of Belfont, the goal was to make it to freedom. And it was by way of a multitude of named and unnamed committed soldiers of God and of community that followed the path to freedom by any means necessary. The goal for the Israelites was to make it to freedom because that was the plan of God. Even though they existed in a world where the king said, we must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. And so I only have one question for you today, and that is, what is it that you're committed to for freedom? What is it that you are committed to for freedom? For God's plan is still for us, the marginalized and the inner circle, the oppressed as well as the oppressor. The goal is for us all to experience freedom, spiritual freedom and physical freedom. For in order for the rope to be dropped from somebody's body means that somebody has to let go. Let go of the plan and let go of the execution. So family, we all need to be free. The story of Exodus is a powerful one, which begins in Genesis. So I encourage you to get some Old Testament in your life. And I know that you've got time. You should be a bit bored with Netflix and Hulu right now. But nonetheless, I want to draw your attention to verse 6, where the word reminds us that Joseph and his brothers had all died which signified a particular ending of an era. And, and though their descendants had offspring and were strong and numerous, there was something within that line that had ended. Now, some might speculate that it was the connectedness or reverence to God that had ended, for the future Israelites' clan had some time keeping it together with God. Uh, but some might speculate that it was the evils of jealousy and abandonment that had plagued Joseph and his brothers that had ended and was no longer troubling the current family. But honestly, who knows? Maybe, though, it was the ending of a perception that was only visible to the outside community. The Israelites knew who they were. The Israelites knew who they weren't. But none of that mattered because the present community no longer knew knew them or saw them. Remember, the goal was to make it to freedom. For verse 8 reminds us that eventually a new king came to power in Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph or what he had done. He didn't know how Joseph was honorable with Pharaoh's staff and wife and how that respect funneled into his community. He didn't know how Joseph's faithfulness and stewardship to God saved that entire region and how that service to God blessed, benefited, and funneled into 
his community. This new king never saw Joseph's people, never saw how the Israelites had been connected and committed for the well-being of the entire region. This new king didn't know any of that. And so we never saw Joseph. He never saw Joseph's people. He never saw them building up the community. He never saw them serving within the community. He never saw them engaging in a life that blessed the entire region and community. All this king saw was a threat as shared with us in verse 9. Look, the people of Israel outnumber us and are stronger than we are. So we must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. So let the truth about humanity speak to you right now. I don't care who they are. If they appear to be smarter, wiser, stronger, nicer, better looking, more fit, happier, anything that somebody else is not, then it's you who may become a threat to which Satan is now always on the standby, ready to feed the evils of jealousy to them. Uh, so that what becomes an individual attack morphs into generation and generations and generations of institutional and systems of subtle, devious, and clever plans to keep you from growing even more. Remember we shared last week that the Lord is on our side. You need to get... ...of your spirit. We thank you for your presence in our lives and that your ears are always open to hear our prayers. So thank you for surrounding us with your grace and for blessing us with a hope that will carry us throughout this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The King in God's name, all's well in heaven, glory in the high places. Some Pharisees from the crowd told him, teacher, get your disciples under control but he said if they keep quiet the stones would do it for them shouting praise again verses 39 and 40 some Pharisees from the crowd told Jesus teacher get your disciples under control but Jesus said if they keep quiet the stones would do it for them in these few moments, I want to put a tag on this text and use as a subject from which to preach, unmute yourself, they don't want no smoke. Unmute yourself, they don't want no smoke. Young brother, cha young brother chained and he can't change it. No, he a genius, but he can't claim it. They gave him no opportunities to proclaim it. He's getting frustrated, and so now he's faded. I borrowed those lines, those luminous lines from that poet, that rap genius, Nipsey Hussle. Neighborhood Nip is portraying poetically through the gift of rap, one who is being systemically muted. He's systemically muted in spite of his gifts. And so Neighborhood Nip says one more time, young brother chained and he can't change it. No, he a genius, but he can't claim it. They gave him no platforms to explain it. He's getting frustrated, so now he's faded. I hope you're getting it because systemically he's being muted. Why? Because of a lack of opportunities. Barriers are blocking him and precluding his possibility. Possibility. No wonder the brilliant Howard University African American Studies, Dr. Carr, Greg Carr, puts it like this. He says, in order for oppression to exist, it, cor it correlates with a lack of opportunity. When there is no opportunity, oppression, of course, uses the lack of opportunity, barriers to opportunity to preclude 
possibility. And so note with me that according to Nipsey Hussle, there is one, a young brother who is gifted. He is talented, but watch it. He cannot fulfill his possibilities because of a lack of opportunity. I want to call it he is systemically being muted. I'm not coming through. I illustrated further with Alice Walker's classic entitled The Color Purple. In Alice Walker's classic The Color Purple, we discover black women find themselves muted. They are muted because of repression and suppression, injustice and insanity, and repeatedly their voices are muted. Perhaps this is best illustrated in what went down with Sophia. If you read the book or watched the movie, you remember Sophia is strong-willed and always asserting her agency, refusing to conform to what others have set up as the job description for her life. Why? Because people will try to define and confine you. And one day, Sophia is downtown with her children. Her children, of course, are where are well behaved and the wife of the mayor comes to Sophia noting how well behaved her children are as if it's a surprise to her of course that is racially offensive but watch what happens because the mayor's wife now has the unmitigated gall the arrogant audacity to say to Sophia will you come and work for me and raise my children Sophia asserting her agency says hell no and when she says that the mayor hauls off and slaps her but Sophia ain't going down without a fight she embodies as it were Claude McKay's luminous line if in in if we must die with our backs against the wall still fighting look at Sophia as she hauls off and fights the mayor but by now a gang of white men they begin to beat her she is beaten nearly to death she is then placed in jail I hope y'all are getting the scene because Sophia now for years is muted she is muted in jail but after jail she then ends up working in the home of the mayor and the mayor's wife raising their children but her voice has been silent she has been muted note with me my sisters and brothers that Nipsey Hussle is speaking of a, a young brother with talents and gifts who is muted because of a lack of opportunity but now we know please don't miss this that Sophia a strong black woman asserted her agency spoke up for herself and now she's been muted by sexism and racism toxic masculinity and oppression all of those are reflections of a, of a diabolical determination to mute her mic. I'm not coming through like I need to. I'm just trying to let you know right now that there is, my sisters and brothers, always a systemic scheme that is diabolically determined to mute your mic. I hope you're feeling what I'm saying by now because T.I. has a commercial about voting. It's powerful. In his commercial about voting, what does T.I. do? T.I. says that your vote is your mic. Don't miss that. T.I. brilliantly says that your vote, when you go to the polls and cast your vote, that is your mic as a rap artist. I think y'all know what T.I. is doing because T.I. is sagaciously suggesting that the vote is a metaphor for your mic when you have a mic it amplifies your voice when you have a mic you get your message out when you have a mic you're able to share what is on your heart cast your vision when you have a mic and ti says that your vote is your mic but we all understand that we live in a country covid 19 ain't our only problem because covid 19 has really ex 
exacerbated COVID-1619. COVID-1619 is a reflection of 401 years of our black resilience in the face of white supremacy and oppression. COVID-1619 has in a real sense come out in full blast being exposed for the world to see because of COVID-19. My brother Bishop William Barber says in this world we discover here it is that that viruses have a way of exposing the fissures, the breakages that already existed in society. I think my sisters and brothers that what Barber is declaring uh, that when a virus takes place it exposes the oppression that is already there and in oppression we soon discover please don't miss this that oppression again uh, denies opportunity oppression uh, diabolically is designed here it is to mute your mic to ensure that your voice is not heard uh, and of course we recognize that when I'm talking about muting of your mic that some of you have been dealing with and perhaps you are tired like me of Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting. Have you been in a Zoom meeting and you start speaking and in the midst of your speaking you discover that no one has heard a word that you have been saying. You have been talking and talking and people seeing your mouth moving but not hearing what you're saying and finally someone says unmute your mic unmute your mic and that's what I've come by to hang out with us and talk about this week it's time for us to unmute our mic I hang out right there why because you do understand my sisters and brothers that systemically there has been a scheme to mute our mic Mike, up until 1965, black people in this country legally, our mic was muted because we did not have the right to vote. But because of John Lewis and Amelia Boynton and Martin Luther King Jr. and many others daring to march from Selma, Alabama through Bloody Sunday all the way to Montgomery, it eventuated in the passing of the voting rights bill which was signed in blood and that gave us the right to vote but we always recognize that in this country whenever there has been perceived black progress it has been met with a white lash a backlash of white supremacy determined to undermine our progress and so ironically it was during the presidency of Barack Obama that so the Supreme Court it gutted the civil it gutted the voting rights bill and as a consequence we are now voting under a voting rights bill that has been gutted and in the gutting of the voting rights bill don't miss it we have seen voter suppression unleashed throughout this nation why because they're determined to mute your mic but I want to let you know when you walk by faith and reunite night in holy wedlock Jesus and justice you have the power to unmute your mic because once you unmute your mic the word is they don't want this smoke I got to give it to you like this as we walk in this text note with me the Bible lets us know that heaven's hero and earth emancipator in this passage which has been labeled and preached during the lectionary about what Palm Sunday the Palm Sunday processional but no it's really in context a march on Jerusalem how do I know because in the brilliant book by a uh, br brilliant book by croissant Dominic and Marcus Borg uh, entitled the last week in which they explicate the last days of Jesus Christ on uh, earth the, they let us know that on uh, this particular occasion it's Passover
and they share with us this is going to shout you right here that there were two processionals that occurred in Jerusalem that week the first processional was a processional on the west side of Jerusalem and that processional my sisters and brothers was a Calvary that was led by a processional that was uplifting Rome it was led by Pilate Pilate was coming in to Jerusalem during Passover why because Passover was a time that was characterized by volatility after all the people of God had faith flashbacks to what God had done in the book of Exodus when God blessed the people to experience a Passover because their homes were covered with the blood of the lamb I gotta park here parenthetically because you have a lot of people during this pandemic who have said that they don't have to wear masks and in their selfish sanctimoniousness they have gone out saying I'm covered by the blood I don't have to wear a mask I don't have to engage in social distancing would you put the text in context because the text says they practice not just social distancing but they sheltered in place they did not leave their home their homes were covered with the blood of the lamb they didn't get outside and say I'm gonna go outside because I'm covered with the blood of the lamb no the home was covered because they sheltered in place preach Freddie Haynes I'm doing the best I can hold on because the text lets us know they're commemorating the Passover they're celebrating the liberating activity of God when God had emancipated the enslaved from Egyptian bondage and the book lets us know that because they were covered with the blood of the lamb that now Pharaoh had to let God's people go and so Passover had become a time of volatility after all by way of context Rome is occupying and oppressing Palestine
Faith in the Furnace, Part 1. The question is being asked today, as it was years and years ago, what do we need in order to handle these particular moments? It seems as we look around uh, this particular republic that the fabric of democracy is slowly being frayed, and that those pillars that we leaned on are no longer there to support us. This nation is in crisis, and those on the edges of this particular moment now find themselves agreeing with those who have been marginalized because the echo of pain, confusion, and conflict is now reaching their door and their ears. Uh, one could say that we are experiencing COVID-19, and we are also in the midst of COVID-1619. And COVID-19 is a biological disease, and COVID-1619 is a spiritual disease that is affecting the body politic and the sociological structure of this nation we know to be the yet United States of America. It is 1619, COVID-1619, where, where our very presence created a crisis in this nation. For we, children of God, hewn from the soil of God's imagination, were defined by human eyes and not sacred vision. Our nation had to cast away scripture, contort spiritually and theologically, uh, in order to prove what was evil as being acceptable. Uh, let me uh, just drive this point home by simply sharing with you a story uh, from the Southern Baptist Convention, that there were those who deeply believed in Christ who were raising the question to Southern slave owners uh, raising the question that, that, that if God says, if the Word says, if, if Paul has lifted up in saying that there is neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free, how, how can you hold a person in bondage? They literally had a meeting uh, arguing back and forth, and some eventually became abolitionist uh, believers known as Baptist abolitionists. And another group who were slave owners said, well, we've come to the conclusion that we've determined that those enslaved Africans do not have souls, so therefore we do not need to set them free, and they are not bound by the scripture in the way that people of European descent are bound. They had to contort uh, themselves in ways spiritually, and theologically. But it is our ancestral witness, uh, people named and unnamed, and from the moment that we arrived on these shores, that even in the midst of this pain, in the midst of a crisis, in the midst of a furnace, we're saying that I will not stand by and allow someone else to define who I am. In other words, they would say before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave. And that brings us to this moment. How do you release the power sewn into the fabric of our souls? How do we tap into the power God has given each of us, which rests dormant underneath the dirt of I can't, lack, insufficiency, and negativity? How do we overcome the persistent feeling of pessimism? The Word of God has been a key component uh, to our becoming our true selves. And it's no less in this moment that we need to reflect upon God's word and deepen our relationship with God. It is in this book, Daniel, that is powerful, this apocalyptic book uh, that speaks to us at this moment. I draw your attention to another group of people who were cast into the abyss of subjugation, fed the fiction that they were less than, and pushed to bow to the falsehoods manufactured by an empire. Jerusalem, the sacred city, the kingdom of Judah fell at the hand of the imperial power known as Babylon. Uh, the king, gentlemen, I don't even know if I should say gentlemen, by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, he's the one who dabbled in human trafficking, dabbled in trafficking girls, boys, and adults. A people who once knew freedom were now under the control of a foreign, unethical power. 
This is the book of Daniel, a book of apocalyptic imagery, but also, hear me now, a story of prophetic resistance in the face of unethical leadership. Uh, maybe I should say it again. Prophetic resistance in the face of unethical leadership. The king, with his fragile ego, needed to hear the cheers of small men and subjugated women, always saying, how great you are, King Nebuchadnezzar. You are the greatest king that we have ever experienced in the entire history of Babylon. It is even on record that King Nebuchadnezzar would say that I am the greatest king that has ever happened, that has ever risen up in this country. Daniel's story and the story of his brothers is wrapped in this context. Uh, let me help you out. Uh, this book, uh, named after Daniel, but Daniel, along with his, his brothers, uh, they were renamed. Daniel was no longer Daniel, he was Belshazzar. Hananiah was no longer Hananiah, he became Shadrach. And Mishael was no longer Mishael, he became Meshach. And Azariah became Abednego. They were given Babylonian names. Because if you want to subjugate somebody, if you want to marginalize somebody, you cannot call them by their appropriate name. You have to give them new names to belittle them. And that's why you have to be careful about people who always want to call somebody a name or out of their name. Because it truly actually speaks to their insecurity and their lack of spiritual depth that they always have to put someone else down in order to lift themselves up. And so now we have Daniel, we have his crew, they have new names, uh, they have been subjugated, they are now under, uh, under the control of Babylon and working uh, in Babylon. They have new names, they are now exiled, living in a new location, but they are dealing with the same old oppression. So I invite you, I want you to read in your scripture chapters one uh, through three, you, you need to see how this book begins. Even if you've never picked up uh, the Bible, I invite you to read chapters one through three. It is exhilarating in terms of the reading and to see what was happening in Babylon and how the Jewish people were responding. And so it is in chapter three that I lift up today that, that you will notice that the king, offers an executive order seeking his subjects to bolster his ego, he makes a decision that he is going to create, create a God that everyone can see. The people will bow down to this phallic symbol uh, that he has created because of his deep insecurity. He creates a golden statue. I do not want you to forget this, uh, that Nebuchadnezzar uh, says to the entire nation, I'm going to build a tower that everybody can see and they'll know that I built it because at the bottom of the tower will be my name so that everybody will see my name and they'll see the tower. Tower that is made of gold that shall cast a shadow upon the nation. Do not forget this. The Nebuchadnezzar spirit continues to haunt this land today. Uh, their God, the God that Nebuchadnezzar builds is not spiritual or dealing in areas of spirituality, no, but is material. They desire us to bow down to what the market deems valuable. Mm. You, you have to be careful. When there are people who define not only success, but your self-worth by everything that is material. What you do and how much you make and what you have. That is all uh, that will eventually uh, disappear. If that's all they can define you as, there's something wrong with them, not you. Here you have in the text uh, that you have an entire nation that is bowing down to the market, celebrating gold and silver. Now, now if I may stop here parenthetically, I did, I did some research in terms of how this, this tower, this, this God that uh, Nebuchadnezzar created, that they 
They mined the silver, they mined the gold, and, and they took that and they built uh, this piece of idolatry. Now you will notice uh, when I did the research uh, that this is not the kind of gold that you have today. Uh, it is gold, of course, but it still has pieces of other types of material in it. It's not the pure, pure, pure gold that we think of with our constant and, and technological resources that we have uh, today. Ah, uh, no, 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 this, this, is, this is gold that still has pieces, pieces of other things. And as a result, uh, they said that when the sun reflected upon this idol and gold of this stature and level, that when the sun would reflect, bless your people and bless all that is said and done so that it might be pleasing in your sight. And so now, God, we stand with tiptoe expectation, waiting for a mighty move of God. You move, God, and we promise we'll be ever so careful to give your name the praise, the glory and the honor on this day, we pray. And we all ask this in your son's Jesus name. And we say together, amen. Why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, 
in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, Paul says, then I am strong. Somebody needs to say, I may not have it all. I may not be the strongest player. I may not have all the answers. I may not have all the credentials. I may have a thorn in my side. And if you're anointed, if you're carrying, if you're carrying the spirit of the Lord within you, you are going to have a thorn in your side because the enemy wants you to focus on the thorn and not focus on the father. Somebody say, my eyes are going to be lifted up. The enemy wants you to focus on the problem instead of focusing on the problem. Somebody said, my hands are up. My head is lifted up. I'm going to walk by faith and not by sight. Don't get distracted. Don't get distracted by the thorn. Don't get distracted by the thorn. The Lord has allowed the thorns in your life, whatever it may be. It may be a lack of something. It may be something that's hard for you to do. You may have some difficulty speaking. You may have some difficulty in your life. But I want to let you know that that difficulty God showed me in my prayer room, that he has given me a difficulty. He's given you a difficulty so you won't get it twisted. Somebody say, don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted. So you won't get it twisted. That it's not Angela doing these things. It's not Angela laying hands on people and they're being made well in Angela's name. Don't get it twisted. I've given you a thorn in your side, Angela, so that you will stay close to me, so that you would realize that if it wasn't for the Lord, somebody say, if it wasn't for the Lord on my side, where would I be? What is your thorn? Paul knew his thorn, but he didn't tell us in 2 Corinthians, he didn't tell us what his thorn was. He didn't let us know because then we'd be looking for that thorn in, our, in ourselves. Each person's thorn is individual. Your thorn is going to be different than my thorn. But you need to realize all God's children got a thorn. Anybody with the anointing of the Holy Ghost, all God's children got an issue. All God's children got an issue and God has allowed that issue in your life so that not that you can walk around too close to the mirror, walk around with your face, looking at your problem, looking at your thorn, but so that you can pull that, pull back and see, wait a minute. I'm not the only one with an issue. I'm not the only one with a thorn. The Lord is with me so that you can pull back from looking at your problem Pull that, somebody say, pull that mirror back. <laughs> You're too close to the mirror. Stop, stop looking at your problem and look at the promise. My second prayer room, you're in the prayer room right now, but I have an inner prayer room, an inner prayer room. And in my inner prayer room, I have mirrors. There's mirrors. And so when I go into that inner prayer room, beloveds, I can see myself. I can see myself 360. And God will speak to me in that prayer room and he'll say, you're, you're too close to the mirror. Stop focusing on the pain. Focus on the promise. Stop focusing on the process. Focus on the promise. Who am I helping today? Stop focusing on the people. Focus on the promise. Stop focusing on the broken pieces. Somebody say, focus on the problem. Stop focusing on the thorn. Focus on the promise. The 23rd Psalm tells us that the Lord prepares a table before us, a table before us in the presence of who? Somebody say who? In the presence of our enemies. And so if you don't have any enemies, you're not going to have a table. I'm going to help somebody. Good morning, Felicia. If you don't have any enemies, if you don't have any problems, God is not preparing a table before you. A table. We all face doubt. We all go through it. We all live with it. Doubt is real. But even with doubt being real, you've got to understand that you've got to embrace doubt as being a part of you. And when you embrace it and say, yes, I have doubts, yes, I have fears, then that is the first step.
step for overcoming those doubts and fears. If, if Thomas had just said like, the, I, I'm sure everybody in that room was afraid. The scripture says they had locked the doors. They had closed themselves in. They were almost seemingly hiding, but they were still in the room. They didn't let their fear stop them from being with the Lord. And we can't let our doubt be bigger than who we are. Number two, number two, I'm going to keep moving. Doubt your doubt. Doubt your doubt. When you find yourself scared to do something or fueled by fear rather than power, you go ahead and doubt the doubt. You go ahead and say, oh, this can't be real. I know God got more for me. I know God can move more mountains than this. I know God is able. I know God is willing. Don't allow your doubt to stop you. You go ahead and doubt your doubt. If if, if, if you're going through something, you say, oh, I don't think I'm going to be able to doubt that doubt. If you if you trying to do something for the Lord and you're like, oh, this is impossible, doubt your doubt. Whenever your fear overcomes your willingness to serve, you go ahead and doubt that doubt. Whenever your apprehension keeps you from wanting to do what you know God has called you and equipped you and blessed you and empowered you and put forth a will to do whenever you know that God has set it up. Because I want y'all to know something. God will set up stuff for you. God will put things in place that you can't imagine was lined up. God will line it up. God got God, to God, God, make somebody call your number when you need something. God got to allow you to open up your eyes and see miracles happen when everybody else is saying miracles are finished. God will heal. God will deliver. God will bring back the dead. God will bring you back from, from, from nothingness. God will wean you off of drugs. Don't let doubt keep you from being in contact with God. You follow God's way and that's the only way that you're going to make it. Hello somebody. Doubt your doubt. Doubt your doubt. If you ever had everything it takes, then it ain't real. There are some things that you, and you know, good doubt is good sometimes. Because how many of us would be overly inflated? How many of us would be big headed? How many of us would, would be out of this world if we didn't doubt some things? Thirdly, you, you got to make your mission bigger than your fear. What are you saying, real? Make your mission bigger than your fear. What have you been called to do? What is your purpose? Why were you designed? Why did God set you up for this? See, if, if all you can focus on is what you don't have, what you hadn't finished, what you hadn't been able to do, you're going to miss it. If all you can focus on is what you've already done, what you've already accomplished. You know, they, they call that navel gazing. When all you do is sit back and say, I did this, and I did this, and I did that, and I did this. Where are you going? You know, if all you can do is celebrate the few accomplishments you had over and over again, that's a form of narcissism, and, and we know where that will lead. The truth of the matter is, you've got to have a bigger mission than your fear. And fear is real. So how do I get a mission bigger than my fear? I'm glad you asked. You get it from God. God has purpose for each and every one of our lives. And God has set up a beautiful life for each and every one of us. We've got to live into that purpose. We've got to move forward into that purpose. What is the mission that God has given you to do? What is God calling you to do? This is a good time while you're in your house, while you're in quarantine, while you're not working as much, while, while you're wondering and scratching your head and, and you finish Netflix. <laughs> you finished all your TV shows. You you watched every videotape and DVD in the house. Well, this is a good time now to talk with the master, to talk with God, to find out where God is leading and directing you. Lastly, I want to challenge you to build a tribe of believers. Part of the problem with Thomas was Thomas 
had lost his mission because his mission was being a disciple and his mission was going and spreading the good news of the resurrected Christ. His mission was going and telling folk that Jesus Christ was alive and he did, he wasn't following that mission because he didn't believe that Christ was alive. He had lost hope. He had lost track. He had lost faith, but, but that's where he was. But the other thing is he had lost his tribe. He had lost his group. He was not in the disciples. Hello, somebody. People keep telling me, uh, uh, Rev, 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 we can't stand not being in the church. I miss the church. Do you miss the church? I mean, do you literally miss the, the pews and the seats and the mics and the lights and all of that? Or do you miss the people? Because you can miss the church. The point of view of so-called great men, men uh, and even women who stood out because of their intellect and their courage. And they are seen as having the decisive effect on history and their greatest contributions to civilization. But I submit to you uh, uh, that, that we serve a God uh, uh, who sees things very differently and that God has shaped history uh, not just so much with the big name people but with some very uh, small name people and some of us know some of those people in our own lives uh, that we have been shaped by people whose names will never be on the billboard never be on the, the cornerstone of the church will never find its way into a bulletin amen whose names and whose positions Positions are, are unknown, but we know how much they meant to us, and we know what they did for us, and we know how they prayed for us, and we know how they were behind us. Do I have a witness in here? Uh, the, the Bible is full of stories of those kinds of people, and we would do well here in this season right now uh, to know that the Bible says that we look on the outward appearance, but I'm here to tell you that God looks at the heart. I drop by to tell you that you can close the apps on your phones or turn off the cable news and stop your dependence upon big names because you're going to miss if you are always looking at who gets the Academy Awards and, and who's on uh, NAACP Image Awards. And if you're always scrolling through your app to see what Beyonce is doing and, and what Jay is doing and, and what clothes they are wearing, I'm going to tell you that if your eyes is always glued on media, you're going to miss who God is using and you're going to miss who God is sending into your life and you're going to miss who you're sitting next to and you're going to miss who God is sending to bless you and you're going to miss the so-called small people. I'm here to tell you that most of your blessings are not going to come. In fact, they're, they're, I don't even know if you're going to get any blessings from the big folk. It's going to be small people who are going to bless you. It's going to be a school teacher. Do I have a witness? It's going to be somebody cleaning the bathroom who's going to bless you. It's, somebody, it's the lady who wears a net on her head and is feeding you at the cafeteria. That's who's going to bless you. Do I have a witness in here? It's the people who scrub in the bathroom that's going to bless you. It's, not, it's the, bus, the bus driver who's going to bless you. You better take your eyes off the big folks. Uh, it's going to be the small people that God is going to use to make contributions. We look at the outward appearance, but God has a whole nother calculus of calculations on who God uses and how God you. God has been known to do some extraordinary things in history with little known people. The story that gets turned into a movie doesn't always tell the whole story. The history that is told from the point of view of winners do not always tell the whole story. Uh, 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 it, it, be, be, you know that because before 2017, most of us had never heard of Katherine Johnson and Dorothy Vaughn and Mary Jackson. And some of you in here are hearing the names now and you still don't know who they were. But these were, as, the, as Katherine Johnson said, they were the computer with skirts uh, back, back in the uh, 60s and 70s. We didn't know the women who were the mathematical brains behind some of the greatest operations in history. The launch of John Glenn into orbit and the relaunch in this nation's space program. We didn't know that these women existed. We didn't know their contributions. We didn't know that it was even possible to be who they were and do what they did until the movie Hidden Figures came out. Until the movie starring
and Taraji uh, Henson, particularly as, as Miss, Ka- Miss Johnson, who just died last week, amen, uh, last month, rather, at 101 years old. Uh, she became the first uh, black woman, uh, one of the few of a handful of black women and a small cadre of black women working, perhaps they say three dozen, who at the middle of last century served as mathematicians for the space agency. Somebody is learning something right now. Ah, uh, uh, they, 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 according to the New York Times, I love how they eulogize her. They say, they asked Katherine Johnson for the moon and she gave it to them. <laughs> Wielding little more than a pencil. Anybody remember a pencil? <laughs> I just want to know, do you remember? I'm, I'm talking to about, uh, let me look out here. Yeah, yeah, you know about a pencil. Yep, 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 yep. A slide rule. God knows a slide rule. <laughs> I didn't know how to use it, but I do remember it. Amen. <laughs> uh, as she calculated the precise trajectories that would let Apollo 11 land on the moon in 1969 and later when Neil Armstrong, history-making moonwalk, it left uh, return to the earth. And yet, in all those 33 years of working for NASA n- and decades afterward, almost no one knew her name. God uses hidden figures. Oh, freedom. Oh, once told his dad and his, the church at Ebenezer when they wanted him to stop speaking out about the war in Vietnam, he said, you may have called me to be pastor, but if it means me not speaking the truth about the war, you need to understand I will not because you didn't call me to preach. In other words, you don't own me. I know to whom I belong. In Matthew's gospel, the 21st and 22nd chapter, Jesus is making his way to Calvary. And in this period of time, representatives from a number of political, religious, nationalist leadership groups come to Jesus to trap him and to trick him. Matthew 21, they question his authority. They question him about the resurrection. They question him in Matthew 22 later about the law itself. And the question in Matthew 22, 17 is brought by two groups that can't, don't even like each other. Kind of like Lindsey Graham and Trump. They used to not like each other. <laughs> But for the purpose of tricking Jesus, they come together. They are the disciples of the Pharisees and the Herodians. Help me, Jesus. They are unlikely partisans. The Herodians represent the interests of Herod. The Pharisees have sold out to Caesar and others in Rome. 
They've sold their allegiance. They're supposed to be religious leaders belonging and serving God. But they've sold out to two ruthless leaders, Herod and Caesar. Herod comes from a family that will kill you and put you in concentration camps just to stop you from try testing his power. Caesar controls the Senate, controls the courts, controls the media, controls the army. Both of them are ruthless. And just by that mere brief decision, you might know, if I might put in parenthesis, that the spirit of Herod and Caesar still lives. They have teamed up to try and trick Jesus. Most of the time they are fighting for power against each other. But to stop Jesus, to stop the movement of love and the movement of justice, they come together because Jesus refuses to bow down. He's already said, I and the Father are one. He knows to whom he belongs, for he heard the voice speak when the dove descended from heaven as he came up out of the baptismal waters. This is my son, in whom I am well pleased. So their question is short and to the point. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor, to Caesar, or not? Now, if you might... Bear with me a moment. The tax here is the census tax. You know, Rome did a census as well. And they did it to count so they could put a cost on people to fund Caesar's greed. That glory. And the tax per person would have been that of what we call one denarii. For some people, that would have been one day's wages because the, the poor were taxed more heavily than the wealthy. That's why the wealthy loved to be on the side of Herod and Caesar so that they would be relieved of their tax burden and put that burden on other people. Now, Jesus is facing this, and he's got a problem. He's got a problem. If he says yes to Caesar, if he says yes, this belongs to Caesar, then it would be perceived by the people that he's in collusion with Rome. And they are all, the people are already suspicious because all of the other religious leaders have sold out. Why not Jesus? If he says, yes, the tax belongs to Caesar, then he would also be saying that then Caesar is right in his killing. Caesar is right in his occupation. Caesar is right in his taking over the Senate, the courts, and everything else. Caesar is right in his oppression. And this would not be popular among the people that were following Jesus. But on the other hand, if Jesus just says, no, you shouldn't pay it, then he's going to be suspected of being a revolutionary, which he already is suspected of being one, but this would seal the deal and would seal the sentiment that he was against Rome and they could kill him on the spot. Now, we know Jesus had already decided he would die on his own terms. So Jesus answers differently because sometimes when people are trying to put you in a trick, you have to trick them by elevating the discussion. So rather than answering the trap that they plan because he's aware of their trickery, the first thing he does is throws them off by saying, you hypocrites. Every now and then it's important for you to let lying folk know you know they're lying. Just, just go and tell them. <laughs>